Здравейте, приятели, аз съм Петко, а вие слушате Рацио Токс, един от нашите формати, в които си говорим с много интересни хора. Днешният епизод е малко по-специален, тъй като разговорът ни ще е на английски. Наш гост е Дейвид Хоун, който е палеонтолог, писател, преподавател в Queen Mary University в Лондон. Изследва поведението на динозаврите и техните летящи роднини птерозаврите. Един от малкото хора, всъщност, които са се заели с тежката задача да изучават социалния живот на динозаврите. Това не знам как се случва, но предстои да разберем. Както казах, разговорът ще е на английски, така че за унези от вас, които говорят свободно езика, надявам се да се забавлявате. All right, David, welcome to the show, mate. Uh, hi, thanks very much for having me. How, how are you? You arrived just yesterday in uh, Bulgaria. Yeah, I, I arrived yesterday afternoon. Um... Straight to the hotel, straight to dinner, straight to bed, straight here this morning. So right. I've seen tragically little of Sophia so far. Okay, so that's that's good because you don't have any preconceptions. You mm, know, pretty you, much, no. Okay. So you will be surprised, uh, you know, at, uh, all, all, all the time. Have you been to Eastern Europe before? Um, I, I don't know if you'd class it as Eastern Europe, but I've been to Budapest. So, so Budapest. probably, yeah. All right, but you're a paleontologist. Don't you travel to Eastern Europe? Don't we? Isn't there like plenty of stuff to study here? Uh, so Poland has a fantastic collection of Mongolian fossils. So yeah, I've been to Warsaw to see some of that material. Right. Uh, there's some great stuff, certainly, but not necessarily what I work on. So yeah, yeah, it's... I know it's here. I haven't necessarily seen that much of it. <laughs> well, I mean, we, we, we've spoken to Bulgarian paleontologists before on this on this mm. format, and we've done a few events uh, with them. And my impression is that when it comes to the Balkans, at least, uh, the types of dinosaurs that we used to have here are tiny ones. Usually they're small. Yeah, right? so you've got what we'd call endemic island dwarfism. Uh, wow. So, yes, yeah, so endemic things that are limited to that area, islands, Mm -hmm. islands and dwarfism being small yeah um and so you have this really cool phenomenon in biology for islands where small things get really big which is why you get things like giant tortoises and right. stuff like the dodo so a, a giant pigeon and big things get really small and so you get miniature dinosaurs and right. indeed miniature other things my, my favorite example of this is crete And it's relatively recent, so I can't remember the date, but it's something like the last quarter of a million years, relatively recently. And you had miniature elephants and giant swans to the point that you had swans bigger than elephants. Wow. And that's living together. And that's just such a <laughs> wonderful <laughs> example of island giantism for the swans and island dwarfism for the elephants. Right, right. Well, well I just recently find, found out that during the, uh, during the, what is it, the Jurassic era, uh, uh, this area used to be like a bunch of small islands. Yeah, so, I, so think, archipelago. I think early to late Cretaceous mostly. Again, right. I don't work in this, sure. despite yeah, being yeah, European, yeah, yeah. I don't look at this stuff very much. Um, but yeah, you basically had an extensive island chain. It was almost like bits of the Mediterranean are now, or Cuba and the Caribbean, or, or bits like that. Right. And so yeah, you had a whole bunch of relatively small islands, and this tends to drive, A, the origin of new and unusual species, which is why you get weird things in Hawaii, and Madagascar, and Cuba, and places like that, and uh, New Zealand. But also it tends to, yeah, promote in particular big things getting small, which is why you have a bunch of really small dinosaurs. Yeah. Um, and this goes back a long way. So um, famous paleontologist uh, Franz Nopska, who I think I'm saying Nopska, Nopsha, N-O-P-S-C-A. No idea, Dave. So yeah. I wouldn't, yes, he's Transylvanian. Um, but yeah, basically said, no, I think these are dwarf animals. And he's writing this in like 1910. So this is... Yeah, serious bit of history for paleontology that people had recognized this very, very early on, um, but just not studied very much until relatively recently. And as you say, a number of people have been really picking up on it in the last yeah. 15, 20 years. And so there's still lots of stuff coming through now. And I think it's one of those ones that, yeah, give it another 20 years. And I know it's a long time to wait, but, you know, I think we'll have a really good understanding of the biology and ecology and just the species that are out there. Because, yeah, as you say, we're still turning up new stuff right now. Right, right. Well, uh, in the next few days, you'll get a chance to meet uh, Vladimir Nikolov, who is a Bulgarian paleontologist. Mm. He's actually younger than I am. He's uh, very young, and he's the prominent, uh, not the prominent, well, the guy who is yeah. uh, who is studying these tiny dinosaurs here in, in Bulgaria. So I'm sure you're going to have a very nice conversation. He's I, a fantastic artist, by the way. Yeah, so I've well. heard. Yeah, yeah. Can you, can, you, can you draw? Is that is that part of the, so there's, the curriculum? 
there's an amazing number of paleontologists who are great artists, and right. I am not among them. You know, no. um, I can do good technical drawings. So mm -hmm. if you want me to draw a skull bone or a tooth or a vertebrae or something, I can do that very technical, linear, almost like architectural drawing of anatomy. Mm -hmm. But drawing, not no, really. no, no, Dr no, not really, dreadful. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I don't even try anymore. All right, let's take a let's take a step back because I'm always interested in how people uh, get into the field that mm. they are right now. Are you the classical story in which uh, I don't know? You watched a movie, or you just open an encyclopedia, or you found something in your backyard? No, I mean, what I'm I am very different to almost every I won't say every paleontologist, but almost every dinosaur paleontologist I know in that I was not always obsessed with dinosaurs as a kid. Like every other one I know was just like, this is the one thing they, you know, in the same way we have kids who want to be astronauts sure. and yeah. firemen and, and, and paleontologist is one of those classic jobs. And then they, you know, they kind of, they never grew out of it. Mm. I was never into it. I was into all animals. Right. And dinosaurs were just part of that because I thought mammoths were cool and I thought lions were cool and I like birds and I like frogs and I like fish and I like millipedes and beetles and slugs and everything's interesting. And then pretty much that, that stayed with me and I worked at London Zoo for a bit. I went and did a biology, I actually did a zoology degree and then I went to the Natural History Museum in London to do my master's. And then you had to do like a big dissertation, a big project for like half of that. And I was hunting around for stuff to do. And I had a supervisor and he said, well, I'm doing some stuff on what are called super trees. This was a big thing in the 90s. And now it just basically doesn't exist anymore. Um, but it was a way of bolting together family trees of, of, of species. Because this was when we were just starting to develop this ability to make complicated family trees of species relationships, but the computing power wasn't there to do lots. Mm. You could only do little ones. And so super trees was a way of bolting the little ones together to make bigger ones. Um, and he said, and I thought it might be fun to do it on dinosaurs. Would you like to do that? And I'm like, yeah, that sounds cool. And so that's largely what became my project. And then I'm hunting around for PhDs and people are like, well, you're, you, you're a dinosaur guy. And I'm like, no, I, I did a zoology degree. And yeah. I, half my master's was on other stuff. And I did animal behavior and taxonomy. And, and they're like, mm. and then a paleontology PhD came up. So it's like, so I did that one. Right. And then it, here I am. Here, here you are. And, and you are, <laughs> by the way, one of the a uh, few guys, well, the the only guy that I know or heard of who is actually studying the social life of uh, of dinosaurs, and I was wondering whether your your background and, as you said, animal behavior, zoology, uh, actually like drew you to to this direction. Yeah, or... absolutely. So, yeah, I was always interested in animal behavior. I did my undergraduate at Bristol in the UK, who were real specialists in that. They taught a lot of material on that, and they had some top animal behavior people there. In fact, they still do. And that was one of the big reasons that drew me there. So I'd studied a lot of that stuff. And then it was around the time my first postdoc, so I'd moved to Munich. I was working in Munich for a couple of years. And, you know, the hurly-burly of doing a PhD, you're kind of focused. And then this was one of those times where I actually had time to kind of sit and think. And I was thinking more and speaking to people more. And I think I'd matured a bit as a scientist and as, a, as an academic. And I started reading some of this, some of the dinosaur literature. Uh, I didn't actually do dinosaurs for my PhD. I did pterosaurs, the flying reptiles, mm -hmm. who are very close relatives of dinosaurs. And so the, some dinosaur stuff was involved, but I wasn't really a dinosaur guy at that point. And I was, that's what I was doing in Munich. And reading some of the literature and going, this stuff's like a century out of date. Like, <laughs> you know, what I was taught seven, eight, ten years ago as an undergraduate was more advanced than what I'm reading in new papers being published today. Oh, that's that's not good. We mm. we should be looking at this in a much more modern context. And what I've discovered, and I'm sure some colleagues are going to watch this podcast and be offended, but I've been saying it for long enough now. A lot of paleontologists come into paleontology either through geology, and so with very limited biology, or through a more general biology degree, which may not include much animal behavior and ecology at all. Whereas that's what I'd really focused on, coupled with working at a zoo with giraffe, rhino, big antelope, and a lot of animals that have certain analogs that often gets written about in the literature for dinosaurs, because 
the multi-ton herbivores. We don't have right. many other models. So I know those animals well, and I know their biology well, and I know animal behavior in general quite well. And then I'm reading, this is how we think Triceratops lived, and this is how we think, therefore, Tyrannosaurus must have hunted. And I'm like, none of this makes sense. None of this matches any of my understanding of... How animals work. Yeah, basically... Some of it did. There's still mm. some very good stuff going back into history. I don't want to pretend I'm a complete revolutionary and I've come mm. in and stomped all over it and everyone else had got it wrong. There was really good stuff in there, but it was the minority, not the majority. And so looking at this stuff going, this stuff is flat wrong, and I think these people don't even realize. And here's ways you can start addressing it. Um, kind of what drew me in. And then I wrote a couple of papers on that sort of stuff um, during that postdoc that didn't get published until a couple of years later where I was working in China. And in that job, I was pretty much given free reign. I was I was basically hired and told, work on whatever you want. And I'm like, well, awesome. I've been really thinking about this for the last couple of years. And that, you know, and th as a postdoc, that doesn't usually happen. You've mm. usually got a focus project, you've got targets, or you've written a proposal. And in this case, it really was, no, we want to bring some people in to just do some work, do mm. whatever, largely do whatever you want. And so that really gave me a couple of years of not entirely free reign because I had lots of other projects going on, but to to really start pushing that stuff. And yeah, as a result of that, yeah, I've done an awful lot on <laughs> social behaviors and interactions and ecology and, and what that means for dinosaur behavior. It really surprises me what you just said, that most of the, the things that you've read didn't make any, any sense to you because, I mean... Nothing makes sense uh, unless it's uh, <laughs> it's it's looked uh, through the lens of evolution. I think who said that? Like Branislav Maninovsky or someone, uh, someone like that. The, yeah. Um, ah, it's dropped out of my head. Well, th that Damn happens it, quite a lot. Uh, with yes, age, uh, uh, yes. And then there's it, the Golden McFadden quote, which comes after it, and I can't remember the original one now. Damn well, it! If it, if it yes. pops up, yeah, yeah, yeah. Feel, feel, feel free to mention <laughs> it's it. Uh, uh, I guess I guess my point was Dobzhansky. That, Dobzhansky, yeah, that's that's Got that's that. the guy. That's the guy. Yeah. Uh, I guess what I uh, what I what I meant by that is that um, you know, l looking through the uh, through the um, through the prism of evolution, yeah. uh, we are all essentially guided. All living creatures are guided by the same basic principles, right? I mean, it's uh, uh, survive, eat multiply yeah and from there you can sort of extrapolate the types of behaviors we might expect so what didn't make sense in in the studies that you that you read i mean so what the, was the wild speculation that so for the, you was... the stuff that really got me into it was looking at the stuff on sexual selection okay so this is the classic lion's mane the peacock's display birds of paradise all right. these other things and anything that basically get to use sex as an animal, which interestingly is one of those real interesting areas when you talk about evolution, and yeah, it's like the kind of bigger picture of evolution, because uh, sexual selection often runs, often, not always, runs counter to natural selection. Sure. Um, you know, deer fighting each other to death, that's not a good survival trait, but mm. if it means you get to mate and your genes are inherited, it's a very good idea. Um, and so that's where sexual selection kicks in. And what I found reading the literature at the time for dinosaurs was kind of, first of all, people said, well, there's no sexual dimorphism in dinosaurs. So that is two different versions of a sex. So again, peacocks are really obvious. One, yeah. You know, the males are very different to the females. And so we've never seen this in dinosaurs and it just, just doesn't exist. Well, um, you're, say you're saying that males and females don't differ that much. That's what people were saying <laughs> wow, in, that in the literature. Me. Okay. Yeah. Um, and therefore, there's no sexual selection. And you're like, okay, well, there's some big, you know, that, 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 that's a, as a fundamental statement, that's just not true because you can have sexual selection without sexual dimorphism. Right. Thomas Huxley wrote about this in 1904. So we're now a century out of date on how you think wow. sexual selection operates. And actually, Darwin even wrote about it in his book, um, Descent of Man and Selection Regarded to Sex, in, I can't remember the date now, something like 1870. So again, this was not a new idea, and yet the paleontologists, or at least the paleontologists looking at dinosaurs, because again, there's lots of other people looking at other animals, mm -hmm. had basically either missed this or ignored it or didn't understand it. It's because there were geologists before then. I, I, I think, I <laughs> think a lot of them. of them, yeah, just hadn't read this stuff. And they thought that 
sexual selection was fundamentally tied to sexual dimorphism, and it simply isn't. Mm. There's stuff called mutual sexual selection, where basically both sexes display to the other sex. And so they both have pretty patterns or features or are doing the same thing in the same way, but it's still driven by that access to a better partner and therefore better offspring and therefore do better. So you can have sexual selection without males and females differing. So is that what's happening with dinosaurs? They both had these features? So that, and then... So that's what I originally wrote. So I had a big paper out in, it, it, it dragged through review, but it eventually came out in something like 2010, um, saying, yeah, I think mutual sexual selection is operating, and that would explain why we don't get sexual dimorphism in dinosaurs, or at the bare minimum, everyone ignoring this and assuming sexual selection isn't operating is not the way we should look at this. That's, that's a, a fundamental you know, incorrect assumption. Yeah. And if all your extrapolations are based on a fundamental incorrect assumption, you probably want to go back and revisit them. Right. So that's where I started with that, thinking mutual sexual selection was really common and we just missed it. I now think increasingly that dimorphism is there and we can't detect it which is a more complicated problem, <laughs> yeah. unfortunately. It's a, it's a complicated problem related to, to studying dinosaurs in general, isn't it? I mean, because you need soft tissue of some sort. For it's, not, yeah. it's less soft tissue. So that's going to be part of it. There are going to be animals that had big, colorful features or had something in soft tissue, so an inflatable crest or a, a dewlap under the neck or whatever, and that won't show up in bones and therefore you, you can't see it. That's definitely one arm of it. The other arm of it is basically the growth trajectory of dinosaurs and our data sets because dinosaurs are horribly incomplete and inconsistently preserved. So if you look at something like wildebeest, so I'm just finishing up a paper on wildebeest at the moment. Um, so, you know, that classic African herbivore and males and females look very, very similar. If, you, if you're standing even, you know, 20 meters away and look at a group of them, it's not obvious which are males and which are females. Yeah. If you sit down and start measuring them, you soon find that all the females are smaller and have smaller horns, and the males are bigger and have bigger horns. And if you plot them out on a graph, all the females are at the bottom and all of the males at the top. But you can draw a straight line through them. The very biggest females look basically identical to the smallest males. Wow, okay. So imagine if you didn't know what sex they were and all we had was just 20 heads. Yeah. And you plotted them on a graph, you'd just get a straight line and you'd see no difference between them and you'd have no way of knowing where that cutoff lies. Well, that's what we have for most dinosaurs. Actually, you're very lucky if you've got 20 heads. You've more likely got five. So oddly enough, it's very hard to see where a gap between males and females might actually sit. So it's uh, very difficult to determine from a fossil what uh, whether whether a dinosaur was female or male. It's, which... it's not impossible, but it's a nightmare. Oh wow! So f lots of things you you soon discover as a as a biologist. People think are normal because they're normal in mammals or they're normal in humans. And that's totally different to how most other things do them. And one of these things is stuff called medullary bone. And medullary bone is this weird bone texture that birds and reptiles um, kind of lay down, literally. The, during the breeding season, females, if you killed one and took the skin off, you'd see the bone, the surface bone is actually weirdly textured. Mm -hmm. And that's medullary bone. And the reason it's weirdly textured is it's got loads and loads and loads of blood vessels running through it because those animals are going to lay eggs and the egg shell is applied basically at the last minute. So suddenly that animal needs a ton of calcium at very short notice. So what they do is they grow this extra layer of bone with loads of blood vessels and then you can peel it all off with those blood vessels to break it down, stick the calcium in your bloodstream, dump it on the eggs, lay the eggs. And that shows up in dinosaurs. So you can find a dinosaur, cut the bone up, grind it down, look at a very fine scale under a microscope, and if it's a medullary bone, you can see it. So if you do that, you can prove that the animal you've got is a female. And not by size. No. No. The, wow. No. Okay. So that's great. 
but if it's a male, it won't have medullary bone. But also if it's a female out of the breeding season, it won't have oh medullary my bone. God. Or it's a female who was during the breeding season, but she was really ill that year, so she didn't lay eggs. Or she's a juvenile and isn't ready to lay eggs because she's too young. So if you find it, you've got a female, but if you don't find it, it's not a male. It could be male or female. And oddly enough, paleontologists and museums don't like you cutting up every bone of every dinosaur you yeah, find but, to, to yeah. grind it up. So we have found medullary bone in a whole bunch of dinosaurs, but only a handful. And all it really tells you mm. is that individual was female, but it doesn't tell us anything about the others, whether we find it or not. I mean, if something as simple as identifying the sex of an animal is so difficult, how the <laughs> hell do you study their social life? Um, well, with difficulty and with a lot of caveats. So yeah, I think <laughs> I, I I think I've my my kind of primary contribution to dinosaur behavior for like the last 15, 20 years is mostly to say, we've all agreed that we know this, and actually I don't think we do know it. Um so I, I've, Here's more, a wild I, guess. I've more rolled it back rather than pushed it forward. Uh -huh. But I like to think I've rolled it back to a point where we're we're kind of all happy. Um but you can start to do it from key specimens or key taxa, key species. So one I've done quite a lot of work on is this little thing from Mongolia called Protoceratops. So everyone's, pretty much everyone's heard of Triceratops. Yep. Protoceratops, Triceratops without the horns, more or less, and like a tenth of the size. They're, they're like a big dog with a, with a fairly big tail. Yeah. They're, they're a pretty small animal. Um, and a, cute, these, a cute one, though. I yeah, think. yeah, I think so. Yeah. And these things are knocking around in the late Cretaceous, really close to the end of the dinosaurs in Mongolia, uh, in a in a more or less a desert or a semi-desert. And they're present in huge numbers. We have hundreds, not just of like bones, but hundreds of whole skeletons, and everything from like hatchlings with a skull this big, like two three centimeters, all the way up to something that you know when I hold it up, it covers my chest. Right. So you've got a whole growth range from very, very young to big adults and everything in between. And as near as you're ever going to get it for dinosaurs from one time and one place. So you can more or less treat them as one population, which is really important because, you know, you just look at somewhere like even South Africa and like the lions in South Africa are doing different things to the lions in Botswana that are only you know, 500 kilometers away. There are local population differences and you can't just treat as people tend to. It's like, oh, well, we've we've gathered all the T-Rex data. Well, right, but that covers like 40,000 square kilometers and 3 million years. Are you really sure that guy in Alaska is doing the same thing as that guy in Mexico? Because 2 million years later. Sure, I, yeah. I think they're probably not. <laughs> yeah. um, but with Protoceratops, you've yeah, virtually got a population they're, they're a single entity and you can treat them all as one thing and when you look at that you start finding some interesting patterns so we've now got half a dozen different groups of protoceratops so a whole bunch of animals found together that died together and preserved together and we've got really small babies we've got mid-side babies we've got kind of a dinosaur equivalent of teenagers and we've got big adults all in groups and you only find them with animals of their own size. And so that really suggests that throughout their lives, they're spending time in groups of animals of about the same age. Yeah, so babies with babies, teenagers with teenagers. And adults with adults, right. Huh. And so that does suggest a real social pattern. Because if you found one fossil, well, maybe they just happen to be together. But when you keep finding them, that's Clearly, you know, you, you can always have a one-off. There can be a yeah. rare, for whatever reason, it happened to be mating season or there was a bit of a drought. They all came together, they all died, and that's why they're together. Right. But when you've got six different incidents and they all match exactly, hmm. that suggests that's a real pattern and something that's really going on and that they regularly lived or hung around in groups throughout their lives in age-separated or size-separated classes. Well, that's really surprising because do you see that in herbivores today? I mean, I usually see a calf like with the cow. And, yeah, you know, and, it's and like, so... I don't see like baby dogs running around. And You don't, but that's because mammals and birds operate so differently to dinosaurs. And this goes back to that growth point I mentioned a, a little while ago with the sexual dimorphism. Because if you look at birds and mammals, what we do is we race to adult size and then stop. Humans are quite unusual and we actually take 
you know, 15 years to, sure. to get to, to get to adult. But, you know, if you look at like an elephant, an elephant is pretty much full grown by the time it's what, eight, nine, 10, and they'll mm -hmm. live for 70 years. Yeah. So they have 60 years of being one size and only 10 years of being right. anything less than that. And birds do something pretty similar. You know, even the big eagles are like full size at two and mm. they'll and they'll be ninety percent of that size within a year, right, fifteen months. Um, and then they'll live for 20, 30 years. Well, dinosaurs are much more like crocodiles. They're it varies. I, I always hate whenever someone says dinosaurs did or dinosaurs were because you're talking about 1,500 species over 150 sure. million years, there's a lot of variation, mm. a lot. But on average, they're growing quite quickly, but over a very extended period of time. And so actually, you've now got, uh, and they're probably, again, very similar to, to, to crocodiles and actually big lizards and, and snakes, they're probably sexually mature at about half adult size, li linear size rather than weight. Mm -hmm. Um, so yes, yeah, so you've got a, you know, T-Rex gets up to about 13 meters. They're probably sexually mature about six to seven meters, huh. a much, much smaller animal. So that means that you're really dragging out that growth phase of being an adult. And so going back just a little bit to that male and female thing, I already said, you know, with wildebeest, you've got this dead straight line between females and males. Imagine if those females take 10 or 15 years to grow to that size and the males take 10 or 15 years to grow to that size. Now you've got a whole bunch of small males overlapping with the females as well. Right. No wonder you can't pull them apart or at least potentially for dinosaurs, that's where it becomes really, really hard because it's only the really big old males that are actually bigger than big females. And all the smaller males are the same size as big females. <laughs> My God. Yeah, it, it, yeah. so basically everything just overlaps everything else because they're growing for half their life. Whereas if you try and do that with birds, if you ignore the babies, they're all adult. And either the males are big and the females are small and there'll be a gap between the two. Right. But you just don't see that when they have this annoying continuous growth. Right. So that's part of the issue feeding into then your question about the social stuff is that, yeah, these kind of teenagers are kind of adults at this point, effectively. They're just little adults. They're sexually mature. They're probably fighting for territories and having sex and having babies, which means also their sexual selection features are kicking in mm -hmm. younger than they would for adults. For, sorry, adults of of things like mammals and birds. So that's going to confuse that signal again. But it also means that social aspect is then very, very different because these animals are operating differently. If you look at um, a mammal or a bird, you know, you're giving birth to an animal that may be 10, 20% of your body weight. You know, that's quite common for mammals. Um, and uh, bird eggs, I mean, my favorite one is the kiwi. So a kiwi lays an egg that is half its weight of the mother. Oh my God. Yeah, the poor, X, the, the, poor X, thing. the X rays of them are absolutely phenomenal. Oh, poor thing. Um, so, I mean, that's an extreme version, but you've actually got a baby that is relatively a fair percentage of the size of the adult. Whereas for most dinosaurs, again, probably not true of the really small ones, but for most dinosaurs, there's an egg size limit. You can't make an egg bigger than about two liters in volume. So we got dinosaurs that weigh fifty tons. And have small eggs. And have small eggs. So mm. those babies are absolutely tiny. And you're not just see you're just not seeing the same degree of parental care. We think for most dinosaurs there is parental care. They're building the nest, they're laying the eggs, they're looking after the eggs. So that's pre-hatching parental care. And then after those hatch, the parents are looking after the babies for a bit. That's post-hatching parental care. And we see that in crocodiles, we see that in birds. We, it, there's at least some evidence for it in dinosaurs. It's probably quite common. But that's only extending so far. And at some point, the parents are going to hit a trade-off point where it's costing them more effort and more time and more health and more risk to look after these offspring than it does to leave them on their own to forage. And at that point, they're going to abandon them. Right. They actually become a, a burden and a risk. Um, predators, we know, preferentially attack young. Um, adults of many species get rid of their babies to stop predators attacking them Jesus because God. they because they draw predators in. Yeah. Because um, you, as an animal, you know, evolutionarily, you're trying to balance your reproductive output. I don't want my babies eaten. But if I get killed, I'm having no babies next year. Mm -hmm. So maybe a couple of my babies getting killed 
and the rest surviving, and next year I lay more eggs, is a better trade-off then I try and fight this Tyrannosaur and get killed. God, and then my cool. babies have no defense and then they're going to get eaten anyway. You, uh, <laughs> you, you said something pretty interesting that, uh, uh, for instance, a T-Rex, it can be, uh, you know, half the size when it's mm. already like sexually mature, where, it's a, where you yep. can consider it an adult. But if we assume, and you know, what it means if we assume, I mean, the social behavior is a product of the brain, isn't it? Yep. Uh, so does that mean that the brain is fully developed when the T-Rex is half the size? I mean, <clears throat> when it comes to such sorts of plasticity, we know that kids and teenagers and humans, at least, they, their behavior changes dramatically yeah. while their brain expands. So if, if, I, a tiny, if, a, if a dinosaur is still small, but it has the same basic behavior as would be expected when it gets twice the size. Does that mean that, what, I mean, the brain stops growing or it's fully developed or? Um, no idea, because I've never looked at it, but my broad guess would be probably pretty close. Yeah. Um, I mean, they're not operating at the level that we're at. Sure. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, I'm always extremely wary of applying humans to anything because our mm. behavior is so unbelievably weird sure. compared to even chimpanzees and, and, and other great apes. Um, but yeah, I can imagine, you know, yeah, a half size T-Rex is an adult writ a bit small, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, most of these dinosaurs are probably independent. So not living with adults, um, perhaps with their own and with their own age, but, you know, doing things largely independently and running around and fending for themselves and having to do everything that they have to do. I imagine they're really quite developed in that regard mm. um they're still going to be learning about their environment but they're probably not going through massive massive changes the way a lot of other animals would right and again i think you can see i don't know about the brain development but you know again crocodiles are a great analogy for this parents look after the offspring for a year or two and even then not that much they're just kind of occasionally fending off mm. predators and doing a bit of territory defense rather than like hunting for them and feeding them and, and taking to the doing, park you know right, right pretty like. much pretty much um but after that they're basically on their own mm. you know a, a half meter long crocodile is a fully independent animal which has to be entirely self-reliant to survive for years um it's going to have to be equipped at that level or it's simply not mm. going to survive right what I remember from 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 the Encyclopedia of Dinosaurs that I still have uh, <laughs> since I was like five years old, uh, what made a huge impression on me was the relatively tiny size of the brains, especially of the herbivores. Uh, meaning that, you, you know, you look at a dinosaur that is three times the size of a bus and it has a brain that is smaller than mine. Yep. Uh, how does that work? Um, so one, our brains are weird. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's not a great frame of reference. Two, they're not, some of them are not quite as small as people have said. You know, the famous Stegosaurus has a brain the size of a walnut. It doesn't. It's more than double that size. Right. Pretty tiny, I admit, but if you're going to stereotype, at least stereotype mm. correctly. Thirdly, you can do a lot of extraordinarily complicated behavior with very little brain. Sure. I mean, ants, bees, they're capable of remarkable things. You know, and cuttlefish and octopus, extraordinarily intelligent. Right. You know, and birds for that matter. You know, crows and parrots, famously extraordinarily intelligent, mm. better than almost any other mammal, bar a handful of apes and cetaceans, and yet literally brains the size of, you know, a small nut. Right. Uh, you can get very complicated behaviors out of very small brains. Um, dinosaurs were probably not very smart in the grand scheme of things. And judging intelligence off brain size and other correlates is an absolute nightmare. But on average, they fall out somewhere between reptiles and birds. Okay. So probably a bit better than your average reptile. And reptiles are capable of social behavior, leadership, play behavior, tool use even has been projected for some. So why this isn't possible for dinosaurs, even with their modest brain size, right. it is not a big deal. Right. Does it, uh, is there a difference between the herbivores and the... Um, uh, On average, carnivores have bigger brains than herbivores, and that's true of mammals, but it's also true of dinosaurs. And even, even within the theropods, which is the classic carnivorous lineage, 
There are various herbivores, there's secondary herbivores, and they have brains more comparable to the other herbivores than the carnivores. Carnivores generally have to be smarter to catch food. Sure, that was that was exactly my point. Uh, can we assume, first of all, that um, like the majority of dinosaurs were social animals, that they lived in groups? I know it defend, it, oh, it, it, so, it, so, it's different among species, I mean, but still. On, honestly, if I if you put a gun to my head and said, which which species are you sure had some social aspects? Proceratops is probably the only one I'd name, and I'm not 100% sure there. And the reason is because social behavior is so incredibly plastic and and varied. Right. Um, you know, it it's ve- it's dependent on so many different things and so much context. And the fossil record is so absent in terms of exactly that kind of data for dinosaurs. I am very, very sure that lots of dinosaurs were at least gregarious. They liked hanging around in groups. They tended to hang around in groups. Yeah, because it's safer. It's yeah. more fun. I, I, yeah. think, I think some of those were also social. So to like put them up a category where there's like a leader and a dominant individual and there's maybe like friendships and relationships and they trade favors like grooming and food and the things that we see with things like, you know, meerkats and vampires and, and other stuff like this. Um, or hyenas, but actually nailing that down mm. is so hard because yeah, there's um, there's these famous dinosaur bone beds in Canada, Centrosaurus, so another big animal like Triceratops, but with one big nose horn. That that's all, and then the frill at the back, and the the bone beds of Centrosaurus have anywhere from hundreds to thousands of animals in them, thousands of individuals all laid out, and there's three or four of these, so just absurd numbers of bones and absurd numbers of fossils and, and, and stuff. But it's like, well, they all died in what looks like a river or a, or a, they're buried in a swamp, but they died in what looks like a flood. There's really good evidence that as a herd, as a whole, or as a group, as a whole, they were drowned or died in a river and were washed in. And it's like, okay. So there was a group of several thousand animals together that died together. So that's a social group, right? Well, not if they had an annual migration and every year they had to cross the river and one oh. year the river was 10 times faster because it had been well, unusually I, heavy rains, they're all just going to drown. But an annual migration, doesn't it mean that there is that, that there should be some sort of coordination between the, 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 the individual animals? There, Not necessarily, because if, no. if you all start in place A and you've all got to go to place B, yeah, you just you're all going to go direction. in the same direction at the same time. That sucks. So wildebeest are a, so wildebeest are a cool analogy. So we, you know, you always get the Masaimara Serengeti wildebeest migration, a million wildebeest traveling together, and then you see them swimming the river and the crocodiles and da 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 chasing Simba. Right. So wildebeest normally live in groups of about five or six, mm-hmm. and then they come together in these super herds to migrate. But that herd is basically made made of a quarter of a million groups of six animals. Yeah. Not a herd of a million. And if you go to South Africa, they don't migrate. So they just live all the time in groups of five or six. What actually mostly happens is the females wander off to find slightly better food and the males stay and hold a territory. So at the time that a million wildebeest are going up and down in Kenya and and Tanzania, if you go to South Africa, you just find lone males standing on their own. Hmm. That's the same species. Only a thousand kilometers apart at the same time. And then again, we we try and talk about, well, what do hadrosaur dinosaurs do? And it's like, well, I've got this one species in Edmonton doing this. And then five million years earlier in Mongolia, I've got another species doing this. So hadrosaurs are social, right? Hmm. And I'm like, I can't even pin the same wildebeest to do that at the same time. Wow. <laughs> In the same continent. I mean, it really looks like they have, uh, they uh, like animals form different cultures. I know culture is probably not the same word, but depending on the environment and the pressures that they're facing yeah, in and, the environment, and, and they're that, different. And that's exactly it. Uh, it's a similar one with sexual dimorphism, actually, to go back to that hobby horse. Um, this is a lovely paper. I can't remember the author's name now, but it's from the mid-70s where he looked at male and female size differences in reptiles in North America. And there was this one um, pond turtle he found. And in the eastern seaboard, the males are like 10% bigger than the females. And on the western seaboard, the females are 20% bigger than the males. What is going on? Well, different selection pressures. Sure. Yeah. If males are, if males tend to fight more in one environment, or the, you know, let's say there's limited nesting holes in one place. Mm. Now the females are going to have to fight for the best nest spot, which means the bigger females are going to do better, and that's going to drive 
big female selection. Whereas in the other side, maybe there's loads and loads and loads of places to nest and that's not an issue. Well, now the biggest threat is who's going to get the best male. And then the males are fighting each other, so that will promote big males. It's just localized evolution is making different patterns but they're still the same species. And again, if I, if I tried to do sexual dimorphism in dinosaurs, I'd go, well, I've got a few in LA and I've got a few in New York, so I measure my I clump them together in my data set and measure them and I find no difference. Well, because you've got big females there and big males there. So yeah. Of course they cancel out and you don't find a difference. I didn't realize And it's... how would we know? And that's the problem. We yeah. don't know. Yeah. I didn't realize it was so complicated when it comes to animal behavior, even, even with animals that live nowadays. I mean, I would imagine that you can have a like a small list what not to do when you face a yeah. lion but a lion <clears throat> could be a different thing you so know my, in a different my, location yeah and my, my favorite one of that is cheetah yeah so you, you'll have a female cheetah she has cubs usually she have four or five so you've got a couple of males and usually a couple of males and a couple of females and they'll hang around together obviously until they're nearly full grown and then the boys go off and will live as a group so you have social groups of brothers and occasionally they'll be joined by other random males. So you have a little group of males, and then the girls will go off individually and live alone. So male cheetahs are social, and female cheetahs are solitary. And then during the breeding season, the female will join up with the male gang for a couple of months, and then leave again when she's pregnant. So cheetahs are social or solitary, depending on whether they're male or female, or young or old, or breeding or not breeding. What a mess. Right. And you decided to study dinosaurs. Yeah, well, I know. you don't have I less know, of but that. <laughs> but as I say, what mostly, mostly what I you? keep doing is pointing out to people, stop saying they're social because you found a group. Yeah. I mean, the other one I really like is a spotted hyena, you know, the famous big sure. laughing hyenas, um, because they are highly social. So they have lots of social interactions. There's dominance. There's hierarchies. There's trading of favors. There's inheritance of social status within groups and all this complicated stuff but mostly not universally admittedly but mostly they hunt alone so they live in this big group and they'll defend their territory and fight off lines and they'll rear the babies but hunting they're solitary and so again people go like oh we found this group of tyrannosaurs this group of tyrannosaurs together they hunted in a group no no they were in a group when they died because if you did that for hyenas, you'd find them in a group. But there's no guarantee that they're a group hunter. Sure, wolves are and hunting dogs and a bunch of others. But actually, even wolves hunt solitary about the same amount of time they hunt in a group. Right. So this group hunting thing is based solely off a group living thing. And that does not translate very well yeah. at all. So what about all these popular representations of uh, of, of dinosaurs, like my, my favorite ones of velociraptors, yeah. obviously, you know, because yeah. they are smart, they, they yeah. hunt in groups. Is that bullshit? Well, I don't know, and that's the thing. So mm. it's, I would never want to say these things are wrong because we don't know. Mm. But certainly I think the evidence that's been used to suggest it does happen is flawed not as good as people say it is based on some incorrect assumptions based on much more limited data than people think mm. based on some dodgy extrapolations it's perfectly possible it's perfectly plausible i don't want people to think velociraptor didn't hunt in groups t-rex was incapable of social behavior there weren't lots of groups of dinosaurs some of this was definitely happening but if you look at the relatively clear-cut definitive evidence for any of this it more or less doesn't exist for almost anything mm. because you've got all of these caveats and exceptions and uncertainties about all these things. There's lots of animals which we find in groups very regularly in the fossil record. It's clear they're spending a lot of time together in those groups. Right. What is driving those groups in terms of social behavior, vigilance, escape from predators, access to food, migration pressures, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, we have a very, very limited understanding of it. Right. And certainly for a lot of them, yeah, it's it's really, really hard to mm. say. You know, a good example, there was a paper about tyrannosaurs and the paper argued that tyrannosaurs lived in groups because we had this trackway with two footprints in it. And I'm like, that could have been a male following a female because he's trying to mate. That could have been a juvenile following an adult. They could have been laid down a day apart and they just happened to be going in the same direction. Do you know that was two animals traveling side by side who normally lived and hunted together? Right. No, you don't. So let's not say that. <laughs> All right. I, I know it's a, it's a bad thing to ask a scientist, but if we put 
like the evidence or or the lack thereof <clears throat> aside. Yeah. And you, based on your experience of studying and observing so many animals today, what is your hunch? What is your intuition when it comes uh, to the behavior of, of, of some of the most popular species? Oh, yeah. Lo lo loads of them are doing This is the right. thing. Loads of them are doing it. The question is which ones. Right. And they're... You, right, so first of all, remember, I know you just said ignore the lack of evidence, yeah. but most dinosaurs are known from a specimen. Yeah. Right, most species are known from one specimen. And even, um, excuse me, even um, the species known from a lot of stuff, uh, and even, even species that were living in groups. So you, yeah, you look at something like the equivalent of wildebeest and their mass migration. Okay, that mass migration is going to kill a whole bunch together. But most of the time, they die one at a time. You know, elephants live in herds, but herds don't tend to die. An elephant tends to die, mm. which means what's the fossil record going to show up? The odd skeleton or the odd set of sure. bones. Even animals that live together won't normally die and be preserved together. So if we're basing our data on group living off fossils found in groups, even those that habitually live together, they were born in a group, lived their entire life in a group and died in a group we're mostly going to find single individual fossils because that's how they died. Mm. Groups are going to be really rare and they're going to tend to form under exceptional circumstances, which are the kind that do things like droughts and floods and hurricanes and tidal waves, which are abnormal. So the data is always going to be dreadful in that regard. Mm. And that I think is part of what makes it so hard to be confident. Um, yeah, again, you know, something like Centrosaurus is probably hanging around in groups. But the fact remains, the groups that we do have are floods, probably from seasonal migrations. Mm. So what does that really mean? Mm. Yeah, I don't think it means they lived in herds of a million. I think it's possible, but I don't know. And short of gathering lots more data sets like that so like protoceratops where you go okay we're happy this is a population we're happy this isn't a seasonal collapse you know or a seasonal event these these groups died at different times of the year in different places under different circumstances that points to them kind of hanging around together the whole time although that wouldn't happen we need more stuff like that mm. and that of course is entirely reliant on a it having been happened as a fossil and then b us finding it as a fossil yeah. And that's just really few and far between. I I, I really <laughs> I, I just really wonder what were you what were you thinking? How acceptable is this extrapolation from uh, observing the behavior of birds? Because I mean, I also often explain to my kid, it's like, hey, be careful with that chicken. It used to be a dinosaur. You yeah. know, it's, it's wildly accepted that birds mm. sort of inherited mm. some dinosaurs. Yeah, they will. So yeah. so this is why I've been invoking crocodiles a fair bit. So we we have this idea called the extant phylogenetic bracket. Okay. So extant. Living stuff, phylogenetic, phylogeny, so family trees, and bracket kind of producing a, a limiting. Mm -hmm. And so if you draw out a family tree of reptiles, basically, yeah, birds are directly descended from dinosaurs. Birds are dinosaurs. And then the nearest living relatives to dinosaurs are the crocodilians. Mm -hmm. So if you look at, and not just behaviors, but if you look at you know, anatomy, physiology, all these other things, if you find something in birds and crocodiles, then it's very likely that it evolved before crocodiles evolved and was inherited by them and then was kept by the dinosaurs and then was then inherited by birds. Right. And so if it's in birds and crocodiles, it's a reasonable default hypothesis that dinosaurs had it. So we talked about post-hatching parental care. All crocodilians that we know of, there's 30 species, have post-hatching parental care. The parents will look after the babies at least for a bit after they hatch. There's a handful of birds that don't do that, but it's a handful out of 11,000 species, and they're not ones that are closest to dinosaurs. They're spread around the tree in various different bits. So basically, birds have post-hatching parental care. Crocodiles have post-hatching parental care. Our best guess is dinosaurs did. And then we do find some evidence for that in various groups. So we can make a fairly reasonable behavioral inference based on that. Mm. But if you see something in birds, like complex social behavior in parrots, for example, that we don't see in crocodiles, well, now it's tricky. Yeah. Maybe that appeared in dinosaurs and the birds inherited it. Maybe it appeared in the last few dinosaurs. Yes. And they had it and the birds inherited it, but the early ones didn't. Maybe it's just a bird thing and the dinosaurs never had it.
Yeah. In this context, it it is a bird thing because things like ostriches and kiwis and the earliest birds and various things don't really have those kind of behaviours, so we can actually rule it out. But you've got that problem of when it's missing or yeah. it's only present in or it's present in crocodiles and not in birds. Hmm. Then it might have been at the start of dinosaurs, but at what point did they get rid of it? Right, right. I mean, even extrapolating from 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 birds is, sounds to me like a crazy idea because the difference between the behavior of a parrot and an eagle and a chicken, well, right, and, a, or a crow for, for that and, matter, and, you know. And then you've got the problem of again plasticity, like you know, even male and female cheetah aren't consistent six months apart from each sure. other, or, or a female cheetah is not consistent six months apart from herself, right? Um, so yeah, the, the just the extreme plasticity and and local variation. Mm. It's it's a nightmare, basically. Yeah. And of course, the other problem we have is crocodiles are all semi-aquatic predators. They fundamentally live in water. They are relatively low metabolism animals that are doing certain things. And birds fly. Yeah. They are under very different, weird, selective pressures to the fundamentally terrestrial, non-swimming, non-flying dinosaurs. Yeah. So even mm. among the anatomy and physiology and behavior... Birds are going to have some bird oddities and crocodiles are going to have some crocodile oddities which really don't relate to dinosaurs. Right. All right. It's fun. (laughs) We don't know anything. That's the takeaway. That's that's the thing. I just realized it's like, why are we even having this conversation? conversation? (laughs) What is is going on? Because it's important to know what we don't know and why we don't know it. Yes. (laughs) All right, but what is what, what is your hunch? I mean, if we if we say that uh, you know today, obviously, when it comes to intelligence or you know smart species, you obviously have uh, you know humans like dolphins, fox, uh, you know octopi, etc. Yeah. Uh, what is your hunch? I mean, what is the smartest animal that lived uh, during this age? So, so the, I mean, the one that always gets wheeled out is this little thing called truodon. Um, truodon. Truodon for How good does... reason. So truodon would look a lot like a velociraptor, but smaller. They're uh-huh. very close relative. They're from a group called Truodontids, unsurprisingly, but the Truodontids are basically the nearest relative of Velociraptor and its relatives, uh, and very close to birds. I'm sorry, how do you spell that? T R O O D O N. D O N. Okay. Yeah. So Truodons, like, yeah, meter or so tall to the top of the head. Holy shit! You know, that's meter, a scary. Animal. Meter and a half long. Yeah. Fully feathered. You know, at a, at a glance, it would look like a weird bird. But Truodon has basically the largest brain-to-body size ratio of a dinosaur that okay. we know of. The, the, that we know of is a huge caveat because we don't have many brain volume calculations for dinosaurs. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's pretty small, which obviously factors into these things. It's predatory, which factors into these things. Um, it's got relatively big and dexterous arms. These whole This little cluster of species do, so it's similar with Velociraptor. That's the kind of thing that's probably traversing a complicated environment that's probably capable of doing things with its hands and feet and mouth. Manip- probably good at manipulating things. I wouldn't necessarily say a tool user, but obviously if you can manipulate things, yes. that's probably going to drive more intelligence than you know than an antelope that can hit something with its head and sort of dig a hole with its hooves if it really tried but not very well. Sure. <laughs> so Truodon's got pretty much everything going for it. In general, if you wanted to pick an intelligent dinosaur anyway, it's small, it's close to birds, it's a predator, it's probably living in groups, or at least there's some evidence that some of the other near relatives did, and um, it's got a pretty big brain. That's as near as damn a good guess as you're actually going to right, get. Right. Again, the, the question I can see on your lips already is, well, just how smart was it? Who the hell knows? Who knows because yeah. how the hell do you calculate Probably that? like a crow or well, something. Well, right. <laughs> but that's the thing, because crows are unbelievably smart, yeah. whereas we really should be thinking more eagle. And they're okay as birds go, mm, but they're mm. no crow, they're no parrot. Yeah. And remember, those guys are head and shoulders above everything else. Yeah. So, you know, your average bird is not dumb, mm. but they're no genius. Yeah. You know, chick- but also people have a very bad appreciation. Chickens are way smarter than people think. Just because they hang around in farmyards and, and zoos and stuff does yeah. not mean that chickens are dumb. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'd say probably something like that. You yeah. know, chickens have friends, they form social groups, they know who's dominant and who isn't. Hmm. You know, they, they recognize food calls and remember things. It's all that hmm. kind of behavior is perfectly plausible. Yeah. 
It's funny how, how you know, in, in general conversation, you know, people don't consider dinosaurs to be a successful species. You know, we tend to think of them, okay, they were probably stupid. They were fascinating, you know, enormous, yeah. scary as hell, monsters. Uh, but they died off, you know, they turned into chickens, you know. And yeah. I, I, I think we tend to forget that they lived and ruled the earth for hundreds of millions of yeah, years. Yeah, they, they, uh, they, I've, I've got a kid's book that I, I got when I was about 10, and it's still a pretty good one and it had this page about you know the deaths of the dinosaurs and all the dodgy old victorian hypotheses right and that was one of them and it said like you know dinosaurs dinosaurs died out because they basically got too old as a lineage and were just stupid and were unsuccessful rubbish reptiles right. and the, and the and the response from the author was yes they were absolutely terrible all they did was dominate the earth for 170 million years how rubbish yes. said the human who's been around for 500,000 mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Dinosaurs were pretty 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 cool. <laughs> You, know, just, you, you only you only need to work for the time that you worked. I mean, if and again, if we, if people are going to play that card, birds are dinosaurs. There's eleven thousand species of them now. We've only got six thousand mammals and eight thousand reptiles. Right. So dinosaurs are still doing pretty well, <laughs> and they can fly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. What is the? Uh, I mean, do you have any hopes? Because I mean, obviously, you need much more evidence uh, yeah. to work to work with. Um, so, is there any any I don't know a technological breakthrough, if you will, like a lighter or something like that that might help you guys accumulate more evidence? No, I mean I'm not aware of any. This come I get the artists regularly, like all the various scanning things that you see. And again, Jurassic Park is now like 30 years old, where sure. they've got like the ground penetrating radar. It doesn't work. Right. Um, there is basically still no substitute and won't be for the foreseeable future of boots on the ground. People need to spend time looking for fossils in mm. the places that produce fossils and then have the time and money to dig them up. Yeah, but meaning you will always work with the fossils. You will not be able to look into their, I don't know, genes or, or something yeah. like that that might fundamentally change your field. Um, I don't think so anytime soon. I, th I think we've got the tools in place that we need and that we're going to have we just need to apply it. So, for example, there has been some brain size stuff done. There's some indication that some, for example, the hadrosaurs, the duck-billed dinosaurs um, that were around, very common in North America, Asia, Europe, in the in the Cretaceous, kind of dominant terrestrial herbivores. There's some brain size stuff that shows some groups have bigger brains than others when all other factors are cancelled out. Now, that's something we also see in social antelope. The more social ones have slightly bigger brains because right. they need to think about who's my friend, who's my enemy, who do I think I can beat if it comes to it, what should I be doing? And that would push those towards the more social side. But we scanned like a dozen skulls. Well, we've got more skulls out there. Yeah. And it's time consuming and expensive to scan them. Right. And people would go, well, even if you gave me the money, I've got more exciting things to do than add one more data point. So now we've got 13 scans or 14 scans or 15 scans. Sure. But the fact remains, we know how to scan them. We know how to do the brain volume and the skulls are out there. What we need to do is scan hundreds of them. Mm. But we can at least do that and we know how to do that. Good. And yep. we've got the brain size stuff for at least living social animals. And we can use that to build a model of what should a brain look like for a social versus a park gregarious versus an asocial animal. We've done a bit of that. We could do more of that. But again, it's been done. The method is there and people are happy with it and the data. It just needs to be done more. Yeah. But of course, the, the classic problem of science, you know, we've all got limited time. We've all got limited money. We're all under pressure. The classic publish or perish or to get the sexiest results that you can, mm. redoing something we've already done, but a bit better versus it's doing <laughs> something new. Right. Yeah. But mm. It's not that people don't care. And, and I mean, both paleontologists and people interested in science, it's that the model in the way science is run in the world right. these days doesn't back that kind of study. Mm. So it will always take a very, very long time to produce those results. But I think short of finding lots more groups of dinosaurs together definitely need that but like in terms of yeah is there a big advancement no we the pieces are in place just no one's doing it yeah you need time resources and people as as in yeah everything. it's it's yeah. it's this classic that you know give me five million dollars and i'll do it next year because sure. i can hire a bunch of people i can hire the scanners i can go to the collections i can measure the skulls we can put the data together and we'll do it mm. but no <laughs> No one's going to give him money. No for. one is going to give me. And, and even if you did give me five million bucks, I'd go, there's much better stuff I can do with it than that. Right. 
<laughs> so I, I, I wouldn't want to do it. Yeah. Because again, there's that pressure in my interest and in what I want to do. So hmm. yeah, it, it, it will happen. We, we will get a better and better and better picture of all of this kind of stuff, but it's going to be slow and incremental. Right. All right. Then uh, at the end of our conversation, uh, I'm going to ask you a, like a second grade question or something like that. It's like we are kids, favorite animal or a favorite dinosaur and why? Oh, um, I mean, favorite dinosaur. I always used to say Amargosaurus, this really cool short necked sauropod. So like Diplodocus, but the one feature Diplodocus has is a really long neck and this has got a really short one and right. it's got weird spine sticking out of it. That and Protoceratops, and Protoceratops because I've just done so much work on it and it's so important. Yeah, you got attached to it. We should be a... studying that way more than we are. Right. Um, favorite animal? Oh, it's a big long list. If you, if you absolutely had to nail me to the wall, probably Okapi. A uh, what? Uh, Okapi. So they're the weird dwarf giraffe things. Purple, what is that? Purple with black and white stripy legs. Are you kidding me? I don't. No. I don't know what so this is. There's, there's, there's there's two. Okay, API. There's there's two. Basically, giraffe species. Well, giraffe lineages. What? This is the first time I see this animal. Really? Yes. <laughs> Have you not seen a carpi before? No. That's the, that's the, like a tiny giraffe with a yeah. short neck. Yeah. So about uh, one meter eighty, one meter ninety tall. <laughs> With little ossicones. They don't have horns. They have giraffe like ossicones. They have Ooh, a slightly look at long that beautiful neck. Beautiful thing. Really long tongue. Living deep in the Congo rainforest. Only discovered in 1902, something like that. Wow. Uh, stripy legs. Beautiful. And I've worked with them in zoos. Incredible disposition. They are calm and tame and friendly animals. And just absolutely beautiful. And that kind of brown coat, which is almost purple iridescent yeah. in the right light. Oh, you got to love them. Oh, well, that's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for showing me your copy. That's it's a beautiful <laughs> animal. All right, Evel, thank you very much uh, for having thank this you conversation. Thank you for having me on. It's been great with fun. Me. I wish you good success on your ratio talk coming in. Good. Yeah. I need to rehearse that a bit more. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it is it is going to be on the social life of animals. Uh, uh, of social animals. life of dinosaurs. Of yeah, dinosaurs. Yeah. I apologize. This dead end in science, as we already clarified. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. Uh, so uh, the moment that you guys hear that, the forum will be already passed. So... Yeah, you're going to have to watch the You're going to have to wait and watch the video. Yeah. yeah, watch the video. All right. Well, thank you very much, Dave. Uh, thank you. And thank you very much to all our listeners. I'm going to switch to Bulgarian now. Благодаря ви, приятели, че останахте с нас за този запис. Ако ви харесва това, което правим, може да ни подкрепите в сайта patreon.com на клона черта RACIO BG. Благодаря ви, че останахте с мен и до следващия път. Чао!